Hello, Pythoneers. Today, we're diving into how to create a project that works with the OpenAI API, letting you upload images, send prompts, and get powerful responses from the API. We'll start by setting up the core functionality, including getting an API key and working with image data. At the end of the video, we will have mastered the OpenAI API for images. As a bonus, I'll show you how to build a simple web UI using Flask to take your project to the next level. Stick around, you don't want to miss it. All right, let's get started. First, we need to grab an API key. To do that, head over to platform.openai.com slash API keys. Don't worry, all the links are in the description. Once you're there, click the Create New Secret Key button in the top right. Give your key a name, I'll call mine OpenAI-API, and then click Create Secret Key. Make sure to either keep it handy in your clipboard or leave the page open because we'll need it for the first step of coding. Now, before we dive into the code, there's one thing to keep in mind. OpenAI doesn't offer a free tier for their API, so we'll need to set up billing and add a payment method. To do this, go to platform.openai.com slash settings. In the left-hand menu, click billing, then follow the steps to add your payment method. You'll also need to add credit to your account, either manually or with auto recharge, whichever you prefer. Once that's all set up, we're ready to switch over to the code editor. Now we're ready to dive into the API-related code. I stored my API key in a .env file and already set up the .env module so I can use it in the code. If you don't know how to do this, check out the linked video here. Then, we need to import the OpenAI class from the OpenAI library and install it using the command pip install OpenAI. This should only take a moment. Once installed, we need to initialize our client by passing the API key to the OpenAI class. You could simply paste your API key here, but better store it in an env. Since we stored the API key in the .env file, we'll use the OS module to access it, so we need to import OS first. Then, we can use the getENV function with the name of our API variable to retrieve the key. After setting up the client, we can start making requests to the API. Let's begin simple by just using a prompt as input. Later, we'll expand this to handle image input as well. I create a variable called chat completions to store the response. Then, I use the client chat completions function to make the request. Inside this function, we define three key inputs. First, we specify the model. I'll use GPT-40 because it can process images. I might make a video on the new O1 model once I get access to it. Next, we set the max tokens, which helps control the cost per request. If your response is getting cut off, you can increase this limit or leave it empty for the default. Lastly, we define the messages parameter. The messages list is where we structure the inputs we send to the OpenAI API. Each message is a JSON object with two key parts, role and content. We set the role to user because this is the prompt we're giving to the API. The content is a list, and in this case, we're sending a simple text input. The type is text, and the text field contains our actual prompt. How are you? This structure makes it easy to expand later, allowing you to add different types of inputs, like images or additional text. The messages array allows for flexibility, like handling multiple messages in a conversation. For now, we're just using one simple text prompt. Finally, we print and break down the response. A quick fix, it's chat.completions.create with an S, not just completion at the top. Also, it's messages in plural with an S at the end. Sorry, I messed this up while recording. When we print the full chat completion, we get all the response details from the API, like the use tokens, your developer tier, and so on, but we only want the part of the actual text response. Here to find under choices and message. By adding choices, first index message and content in the print statement, we can output just the response message. As you can see, the answer to how are you today is that it's just a computer and has no feelings. Before we continue, thanks for watching so far. If you're enjoying this, smash subscribe, like, and leave a comment. Let's continue. In this quick chapter, I'll refactor the code. If you're not interested, feel free to skip ahead to the next part where we add image functionality. I'll speed things up a bit here. First, I extract the prompt text into a separate variable called prompt and then pass this variable to the request. This keeps the code cleaner and easier to manage. I also add a short description for the GitHub upload where you'll find the full code. Link is in the description. Next, I make the request more robust by wrapping it in a try accept block. 
If something goes wrong, we'll get an error message. When the request fails, I raise an exception as E and print an error message with an error occurred, followed by the specific issue. And that's it. Let's dive back into the functionality and see how we can pass images to the API. For this version, we'll work with an image path on your PC. I've created a variable called image path that holds the path to my image, which is stored in a folder named images inside the project, and it's called red balloon image. The image we will work as example with is a DAL-E generated scene featuring a child with a yellow cape and a red balloon in front of a volcano. Such a dramatic scene. To ask the GPT model about the image, we need to follow three steps. First, since the API works with JSON and JSON only supports text, we need to encode the image into a base64 string. Here's how we do it. We start by defining the function with def encode image and pass the parameter image path to it. We later will use our image path in the function to create the base64 string. Inside the function, we use with open image path in binary RB mode as image file. This line opens the image file from the image path in binary mode. Using binary mode ensures we read the raw bytes of the image file, which is necessary for encoding. Next, we need to import the base64 module so we can use base64 functions. The imagefile.read function reads the entire content of the image file as raw bytes. We then pass these bytes to base64.b64 encode function. This function encodes the binary data into a base64 format, which is a text representation of the image data. The base64.b64 encode function returns the encoded data in bytes. We use the decode function with the input UTF-8 to convert these bytes into a UTF-8 string. This string format is suitable for including in JSON and transmitting over the web. Finally, return sends the base64 encoded image string back to wherever the function was called. The second step is to use this function to create a base64 image string by passing the image path to encode image. While there might be other methods, this approach works well for me. The final step is to include this image in the content of our request. We add a new item to the content list inside a new set of curly brackets. Then we set the type to image URL. Then we set up the image URL parameter. Therefore, we use inside curly brackets the URL parameter on the left and an F string on the right. The F string looks like data colon image slash JPEG semi colon base64 common curly braces, our base64 image. After integrating this into our code and running it, I realized I forgot to add a prompt related to the image. I updated it to what do you see in this image and reran the code. And there you have it. The model now describes the image from its perspective. You can use this for various tasks, whether it's describing a math formula on a paper or counting items in an image. The possibilities are endless. Great job sticking with me until now. Here comes a bonus. Let's dive into building the simple web UI. Here's a quick recap of the setup. I'm using Flask as the Python backend, Jinja 2 for the HTML templates to handle inputs, buttons, and the response display. We've also got JavaScript for the drag and drop image feature and some basic CSS for styling the HTML elements. The flow is simple. You can drag and drop or upload an image, type in a prompt, and submit it to the API. Once the API responds, the output is displayed on the screen. There's also a clear button to reset the inputs if you want to try something else. Pretty straightforward, right? Now, I'll be honest, I'm no pro at designing beautiful websites, so it's up to you to take this further and make it more advanced if you want. To keep this video concise, I'll just quickly walk through the basics here. Full code is on my GitHub, so feel free to check it out for all the details. Now let's dive into the Flask part of the project. I've created an app.py file where we'll run our server. I also set up a folder called images in the static path where the drag and drop images will be saved and a templates folder for the index.html file. This is standard Flask setup. In app.py, we start by importing Flask and installing it with pip install Flask. Then I initialize a Flask app using the Flask class. To ensure the directory for images exists, I use the OS module to join the static slash images path and check if the directory is already there. If not, we create it using the makeDirs function. Next, I added the API-related functions, initializing the client and encoding the image. 
I wrap the initialization part into a function to keep things organized at the top of the code. Then, I set up the app route to render the web page. It handles two methods, get to display the form and post to process the response. When the request method is post, I grab the prompt using the request.form.get function and the image file using request.files. The image is saved to the upload path we created earlier. We use the encode image function to convert the image to base64, then send that along with the prompt to the API. It's the same process we covered earlier. I separate the response, send it to the web page's response field, and add error handling as well, which I also render in the web page. If the request method isn't post, the page simply loads. Now finalize up the backend using the dot run command to prepare the Flask server, and then let's move to the front end. Starting with the HTML, I've collapsed the styling since it takes up too much space here. Though honestly, it would have been better to move this to a separate CSS file. But for simplicity's sake, I'm showing it all together. I won't go into detail here. In the body section, we begin with a headline, followed by the form that collects the inputs. The form uses the post method to send data to the backend. Inside the form, we have a drag and drop section for uploading the image, an input field for the prompt, and two buttons. Below the form, you'll notice some Jinja2 code. This will display the response from the API when it's received, or an error message if something goes wrong on the back end. The drag and drop functionality is handled through a bit of JavaScript. You should have at least some basic knowledge about it to understand. This part of the script is all the code we need to make it work. The drag over event ensures the drag action is valid and the drag leave event clears the zone when the image is dragged out. The key piece here is the drop event, where we handle the actual file drop using data transfer.files, which assigns the file to the form. Additionally, the drop zone also has a file picker that lets you select a file from your computer triggered by the click event. Finally, the change event is used to display the file name inside the drop zone. And that's it for the drag and drop setup. The last part of the JavaScript handles the clear button, which lets you reset everything and start over if needed. All right, that wraps up the web UI. Now, let's fire up the server and walk through the full functionality step by step. First, I'll start the server by running the app.py file. To demo the drag and drop feature, I'll delete the previously added image. Now, we head to the web UI, drop the image into the drop zone, and enter a prompt. When we hit submit, the image is saved in the static images directory, and the server processes the post request. From there, the request is sent to the API, and once we get the response, it's passed right back to the web UI. And that's it. Everything worked perfectly. If you've stuck around till the end, I'm really proud of you. Great job. Keep coding, and remember, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Now, let's clear the interface and wrap up the video. Happy coding, and see you in the next video. This is right here, check it out.